morning. Any of you who are in the class got the benefit of uh, a discussion about the environment that naturally just arose out of the Bible and it could arise out of any number of verses in the Bible. Um, I'm going to play a part in this unfolding drama um, by um, talking about um, Vedic perceptions of the environment, a kind of an environmentalism that arises out of Vedic thought. And Radhika Raman will follow on with looking at taking, working from that Vedic thought and looking at Gaudiya Vaishnava theology. And that, that's the kind of sandwich that we use. And then Krishna Shetra Swami will talk about cows because he's a bit of a cowboy. He <laughs> 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 likes to talk about cows. Um, but it's the practical application of the philosophy and the theology. So, how does that actually get to ground? And Chris Hittenreich has done wonderful research, I mean, really, really wonderful research, with a book that will come out within the next year on, on this topic that is very traditional, very ancient, and very modern as well. Um, and then um, Gopal Leela, who couldn't be with us, he runs our Bhumi project. He's going to, we're going to listen to him on a video in which I don't think he actually appears. Um, it's just he has slides and things. We don't he, see him. He sent, he, he sent a photo. He sent a photo we could try to... A photo, to... so we could have a look at the photo. He's a handsome chap. Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> we hear him? Oh, we do. Oh, oh, yeah. that's and then um, we do a workshop in the afternoon. So it's, it's, a whole, it's a whole day and the idea is that you pick some things up and... And the Vedic thing, why we're starting with that, not just jumping into Bodhi of Vaishnava theology, because why do we care about the Vedas, but our Acharyas keep on talking about the Vedas very awkwardly. And now we have to take the Vedas seriously. Hands up all those who have read the Vedas. <laughs> so we're taking it very seriously, obviously. But we're quoting it every five minutes. Vedic this, Vedic that. Um, and we haven't read it. Well, there's the thing. So what's in the Vedas that's worth reading? So, I, I could have put my hand with you for the Vedas, right? Yeah. yeah. And you've got the Parts, parts, parts. Parts, parts. Long, long thing. You, re you read the Rig Veda, and what's the first thing that strikes you? This is really boring. <laughs> it's all about yagyas and sitting down and, and saying prayers to demigods who no one takes seriously anymore. They're not even mentioned in the Bible Prana practically. So, so why, why is everyone pointing towards the Vedas? So, um, I, I couldn't figure it out by reading the Vedas, but then I talked to a professor, Narasim Achari, who's a, a very profound Sanskritist from... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just in terms of sequential thought. Yeah, yeah. But if, if, you, if you realize that we have a part to play, then we have to find out what is that part to play. What does that become called in the Vedas itself? Is it science, science or No, it becomes called Dharma. Oh, what is dharma. the thing to do? Again, it's not necessarily a spiritual concept. Hmm. It's, it's, an, it's just a logical conclusion. What is the thing I have to do? So we have two ideas that come from this very easily. One is servitorship and dharma. And dharma is obviously servitorship. It's something that we do for others, for the bigger picture, for the ecosystem, etc. So you're making a contribution. Right from the start, you're giving. Again, we come to another idea, Vedic idea, <coughs> yajna, sacrifice, giving. And what's the rule of yajna based on this thinking? You give first and you take later. Far yajna is you give all this stuff. Um, in Vedic times, it was gold and all kinds of wonderful things and green. And then you say, Dear Lord, please give me back more stuff than I gave you. <laughs> <laughs> you approach the deity and you say, Oh dear Lord, you look so gorgeous, I love your peacock fans, and how about being up you? <laughs> <laughs> so first you give, first you offer something, and then you take. That's the, and that's all Indian culture is like that, many cultures are like that. It's just a natural understanding. If you're the smaller thing, then you contribute first. And it's, that's natural understanding if that's your philosophical starting point. So, so these, these ideas have ramifications in terms of developing environmental theory. Mm -hmm. Let's look at servitorship. So, oh, let's look at Ritta, the fact that there is cosmic order. It is organized. It's just an assumption. You don't have to prove it, it just makes sense. 
It's like that dogs have emotions. They've done a scientific study now and they figured out that dogs have emotions. Who didn't know that? <laughs> what dog owner didn't know that? You know, it's not, it's no, no brainer. So, so that's, that's an assumption. But this is such a fundamental, basic, no brainer assumption that after the Rig Veda, you never hear, hear this word mentioned again. But if you don't understand this idea, it's difficult to understand Seva and Dharma and Yajna and the other things that come out of this, which we'll discuss a little bit later. So this becomes the basis of a lot of philosophical thought that all the all the Upanishads, the Brahmas, the, the um, uh, Itihasas, the um, uh, Bhagavad Quran, and all the Bhagavad Gita, they're they're all discussing the issues that arise out of the Rig plus some other issues that are in there, some other big philosophical ideas that are in the Rig Veda particularly. Um, so, um, servitorship, what's the ecological takeaway for that? Um, the Abrahamic idea is that in the book of Genesis, God gave humanity the planet. And God gave the animals the ownership, actually ownership of the animals, the plants, and everything like that. And if we are the master, if that's our starting point philosophically, that's a very different trajectory than your starting point being, I am a servant. Mm -hmm. So ecologically, the pious realization of the Abrahamic ecologist, and most scientists are Abrahamic in thinking, because they haven't critically analyzed the assumptions behind the culture they're brought up in. So they're thinking, we are scientists, we will be the master, we will conquer suffering, we will conquer death. There's an idea that that's possible. That idea just doesn't arise in Indian thought. You're not going to conquer death. You're not going to conquer time. You know, it's, it's just nonsense. But if you think you're the master, you can do whatever you like. If you think you're the servant, you're in a completely different mindset. So the master thinks, in his highest moment, thinking about the world, I will be a steward. And the steward is a pious master. But the steward is still not necessarily a servant. So this idea of servitorship, we are a servant of the greater whole. That is essential environmental thought. And that comes directly from the Rig Veda and it comes through our when it comes through our tradition, it becomes through a filter of Krishna. It becomes different that's what Radhika Ramana can talk about. When we um, so servitorship and then Dharma, Dharma doing the right thing, thinking of what's the right thing to do, that's Again, kind of a no-brainer in terms of environmental thought. How do you do the right thing? If you understand you are a servant and that there is cosmic order, then that's the context of what is the right thing to do. And the idea of yoga is you're, you're always giving. Your first step is giving. The idea of approaching nature and our first step being taken um, is a very bad idea. That doesn't make any sense. It's actually very detrimental to cosmic order. So we come and we take, because our tendency is to take and take and take and take and take and take. And the give is very minimal until you're forced by corporate social responsibility, a very new concept, that every corporation has to give 2% of its earnings back. So it's what, you take 98% and give 2% two, 2 back after the fact? Mm -hmm. Well, come on, guys. <laughs> You know, that doesn't make any sense. There's no idea of servitorship in that. That's just, it exists for me. So the thinking is powerful. If we get the thinking right, then the ideas that come out of that thinking are very profound. Um, in other words, um, Rupini mentioned, because she's heard me talk about this before. So <laughs> uh, from Rita comes the word Ritu. Ritu is a much more common word. It's a common word in Hindi. It means seasons in Hindi. And in this context, it means cycles. Everything in nature works in cycles. And that's so observable, it's just, again, totally common sense. But it's very important for us to understand that if everything is working in cycles, there is a system. Now, and when I say everything, I mean, we look at day and night, we look at the years, we look at our lifespan, we look at our minds, our minds work in cycles. That's the whole process of meditation, is the assumptions of Ritu. So it, it comes around ice cream. I say, no, 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 I don't have any money. Comes around again, ice cream. 
And I thought about it the last time to the extent that I didn't have any money. So the thought goes, oh, I don't have any money. Oh, I do. But I won't buy any. Comes around again. Ice cream, don't have any money. Actually, I don't have any money. Do I want some? You're deepening. That's, what, that's the whole process of meditation. It's a very simple process. It's based on the philosophical assumption that everything works in cycles. So mindfulness has taken over the world uh, based on the philosophical assumption that most of the world isn't at all conscious of. But So this idea of cycles seems to be natural, and we talk about all the time the cycles of nature, but this makes it a philosophical idea. Everything works in cycles. So if we're going to talk about evolutionary development, the Judaic idea is that everything is going from here to the Messiah, and here to perfection, and here to the kingdom of God. So it's all getting better all the time. So evolution, the assumption is, means evolution means things are getting better. But cyclically, there's evolution and devolution. Things aren't necessarily getting better. They're just going up so that they can come down. We have technological development and urbanization, but we don't necessarily have development of consciousness. So are things actually evolving, or are they devolving? The question remains open. We don't not believe in evolution. We just believe in evolution and devolution. We believe in creation and chaos. <coughs> chaos is an essential part of the cycle. We believe in happiness and distress. We try and erase all the distress, and it'll just come over this side. It's just going to happen. That's just how the world works. And we kind of intuitively know that, but this is put, putting it down on paper and philosophically saying, don't worry about suffering. Don't worry about that. These are just part of the natural cycle. So as we accept the happiness that comes around, then what's our reaction to the distress? That's the thing we have to get right. So that's where these philosoph philosophies begin to develop from. And if we look at these cycles in the natural context, then we respect them as cycles, we respect them as practically sacrosanct. This is just how the world works. And you don't spend time arguing with it, you just get with the program. So there's no point at which we're going to disturb the cycle of death. There's going to be no death or no suffering. You don't, you don't waste time trying to you know, come up with a medicine that will, will do something like that. We get rid of tuberculosis and smallpox, and what do we end up with? AIDS. Where the hell did AIDS come from? Nature just does this stuff. Lemmings. They all get so many lemmings, and then they all go run over a cliff. They have a psychotic episode. We don't know why. Nature just balances things out. We have 7.2 billion people on the planet. When I was young, it was 4 billion people on the planet. What, what happened? And what's going to happen? Because this is going to balance itself out. Because this idea of Rita means balance. It's cosmic order. So there's two sides to it. There's cycles happening. There's going to be this, and there's going to be this. And we can guarantee that. So the, the 2008, we had this big financial crisis. What was the issue? Take, 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 take. No concept of give. Absolutely unsustainable. For any thinking person, just, just look at the seasons, look at the financial system, unsustainable. Can't work. This is really common sense. Um, and the other thing about Rinta is because it's cosmic order, the whole cosmos is thus interconnected, interrelated. Everything in the cosmos is connected to everything else in some, in some uh, significant way, or insignificant way, but everything is significant about it. So, this, so if you want to explore a problem, you look at it holistically, because that's how the world works. The world works as a, a big whole, interconnected and interrelated, and interactions are part of the interrelationship. So if you want to look at a problem in an organization that's got five departments, and the problem is over in the department there, that's not the whole problem. That's only the symptom of maybe a bigger problem, because the whole <coughs> is what you look at. Now, in Western thinking, or thinking of Aristotle, you take everything and put it into silos. You break it into its components. So you actually just look at the, this component here. That's all you focus on. And you fix that, and then everything's fine. So why did that team break down? 
are you aware of the relationship with, between that team and that team? And the fact that this team here doesn't cooperate with either of them? Or are you just going to focus on this? So the, this concept of relate, this, the holistic idea, and this is very much how India thinks. And very much how the, a lot of the East thinks. It's just, you look at the whole, and then you understand the problem. Then you understand what the issues are. Um, and that comes to um, the idea of relationships. So Ritu is essentially about relationships. The level of interconnection is quite profound. So relationships become very important. Another thing I would point out actually that because every single one of us has to find our own part as a cog in the machine, then the question is, if I want to understand Krishna Lila's dharma, I have to ask Krishna Lila. I can't tell her what her dharma is. I have to ask her what her dharma is, because I don't, I don't live in her part of the machine. It's, a, it's an essential pluralism. And people, are, people since the time of Pythagoras have been speculating about Indian pluralism. The two things that all the travelers, all the thinkers who bumped into India, the Chinese, the, the Italian Vasco, the Ghana, and all the people who bumped into it, is the pluralist idea and ahimsa. That's two things that they just find fascinating, that they just didn't have in their own culture, but found very interesting. The pluralism comes from somewhere, and it comes from these ideas in the Rig Veda that every single person has their part to play. And you can't tell them what it is. You have to find it. Because they're the only ones who are seeing what their circumstance is. I can't see that if they're circumstance. I can't understand how, you know, you're born in Jaipur in India. That's, he bars me from understanding most of them. You know, you know brown skin and dark hair. And he can grow a beard easily. This is like after six years, this growth. <laughs> So we all have different circumstances, and we all have to define our own circumstance. So, that, so that's, that's a tremendous pluralism that essentially says that there are many religions and philosophies and cultures in the world as there are people. It goes against the idea of institutional religion, in actual fact. You can get people together as a club and fly a flag, but they're not going to think the same. Everyone's going to be an individual. That's quite a profound pluralism. Um, but relationship is the important um, understanding because what is our relationship with other people? What is our relationship with the world around us? What is our relationship with trees, with water, with all the facets that in the holistic perspective give us life? And if we just encroach upon animals to that much and that has a knock-on effect that we can't grow wheat in this country and that has a knock-on effect that you don't get bread in your shop we're totally responsible for the first action. We have to be able to see the cycle before we act, to see the whole picture. And again, in terms of environmental theory, that's quite profound. That's not how the world acts. It's not how the, how the world thinks. So there, there are some ideas based on Rita, and on to the next big Vedic idea. I'll tell you what the other, um, I'm not over for I think I'm going through everything. Um, Oh, yeah. I'll just read you this thing. Um, the holistic idea, a very important word that comes out of it is integrity, integral, how everything is interrelated, as you said. As we have seen, Rita promotes a holistic worldview to appreciate the integrity of the ecological system. We can look at the material elements as described in our texts. They are primarily earth, water, fire, air, and space. No single element is autonomous. And it is in their interaction that we see their power and significance. Many of the demigod sages and kings mentioned in the Bhagavad Prana are associated with certain elements. But they're all, um, they have a, the, the, the demigods, the sages, the kings, their um, stories are striving for personal, social, or natural integrity. So they're all looking for integrity, how to bring things together. That's all within the quest. So the idea of integrity is not two, but one. So there's the oneness about it. Oh, oh God, I said the word oneness. <laughs> there's another step, this holistic idea, you can see where philosophical oneness comes from, but 
That's the idea, that everything is connected. It is one in that sense. And so to, to speak in terms of integrity on a personal level, on a social level, and on a, on a level of nature. So everything has to connect. And if you're making plans and you're not connecting with things that are associated or affected or you haven't investigated what is, that's a, it's going to be a bad plan. Um, now I will mention two other words that are very important philosophical words in the Veda. And I'm only going to mention them. I'm not going to get into them. Um, one is sat. Sat means? Eternal. Eternal. Existing. Existing. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone said eternal. And only one person actually studied Sanskrit and understood that existing. Um, and existing is often, in the vernacular, it's often discussed as what is real. What is existing. So sat is about what is existing, what is real. And it's often pronounced, uh, uh, translated generally by early Western uh, people as truth with a capital T. It's not a great translation, not a great translation. It's what is existing. But it's a very interesting fact that we're all um, desirous of sat. We're all, we have this impetus to find out what is existing, what is real. If you walk into a room and it's full of people and immediately you're trying to figure out what's what's this. You know, every child does this. It's just a natural thing that happens. So every scientist who has no idea about God or anything like that hasn't proven God, so he hasn't got there yet. So he's using material elements to try and prove what is real, what is existing, what is discernible, and all that kind of stuff. He's just doing what's what's a natural impetus. That's a good impetus. And every spiritualist is doing it using spiritual material. So that they're actually doing the same thing. And again, this pluralism. This idea is that there's one impetus, and there's just many ways of approaching it. And if someone hasn't heard about all this stuff, or heard about it in a strange way, they may just reject that. We may reject science without thinking about it. But maybe there's something in it, if you want to understand the material context. And in SAT, we understand, in terms of existence, Everything that's existing out there, we're not separate from nature, um, but we can harm. We can't. We can't harm nature without harming ourselves. Everything in existence is interconnected. So if we harm one <coughs> thing, we're going to harm ourselves uh, ultimately. And we can't expect that claiming ownership or insisting on dominance holds any sway outside human circles. We just talk like that among ourselves. I own this piece of land, and I dominate this country. And outside the human world, that makes absolutely no sense. Doesn't make any sense to an elephant. Doesn't make any sense to a fox. Doesn't make any sense to a fly or a mosquito. And they invade our space all the time. Right? <laughs> um, but more, more important, um, nature has a more profound claim of ownership and dominance and power than anything we can claim. And um, that is an understanding of existence. Um, and the other word is, not a word we use an awful lot in our, is called circles, karma. Karma is often translated as sex, but it does mean desire. It means desire. Desire is an idea that's discussed, it's very well discussed in the Gita, it's discussed in all our texts. These ideas are discussed in all our texts. Um, and they're, as we discuss them, we look at them from different angles and become interested. But desire is just, we have, we have some idea of what desire is, uh, we discuss it all the time. Um, but in terms of the environment, we have choices to make, and our choices have consequences. And our choices are based on our desires. And our desires are based on our vision, our way of looking at the world. So that's it. And these two ideas, um, we don't have time to get into that, is, is the real issue. <laughs> um, so the final one, so the two ones that I want to focus on today are Rita and the other idea. Pen is running out. Atman. Atman, is it? Thank you very much.
worth of the dyslexic. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm dyslexic. <laughs> Can't spell. Um, Atman. Atman is in the Rig Veda. In the Rig Veda, it's talking about the self. And how does it describe in the Rig Veda? The self? No? It discusses the self in the. Is that? I think in Rig Veda, it's only used as a reflexive pronoun. But, well, it, yeah, it's just um, from Narsan Chani. It's discussed as it refers to, it's used in different reference points to the body, the mind, the intellect, and the more spiritual self. And it doesn't, it doesn't expand on any of it. So it's, it's just a very general the self, and it discusses it in these different ways. And the assumption is that the idea of the self is holistic. If you want to talk about the self, you're talking about the whole manifest self. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about Atma, we're only talking about the spiritual, but in Rig Vedic, and so in the Upanishads and later discussion of Atma, is about the spiritual, focus on that. Why? Because this is the substantial part. This is the part worth talking about. But they're, all, they're not negating the other parts. They're just saying that this is the, and that's the issue of the Gita. What's the substantial part? And it's the spiritual self, because it's the part that has more endurance. But the self includes the body and the mind and the intellect. Um, but these are so temporary. Uh, I mean, the mind is changing every five seconds. The body changes every 80 years. Well, before that, I used to, we all have different minds. You know. We had lack of gray hair bodies, lack of wrinkled bodies, and all that. So, so it, it comes in the Upanishads and the Puranas and these as a discussion about the spiritual self, and that's kind of where we want to focus on the on the Atma. Um, you know, um, Ritta is kind of Ritta is Ritta is the big picture. Uh, the discussion of Atma is the bigger picture. The Ritta is absolutely the big picture <clears throat> because the absolute overview of the material context. So if you want to work and survive and thrive in the material context, and you don't take all this into account, you're just a fool. This doesn't make sense. But if you want to understand who you are, and this is what Karnyamata has begun to discuss and we're not about, if you want to, and it's such a fundamental philosophical question, and I'm not, I can't find any instance in any other philosophical system where they specifically ask that question. So they don't discuss it in Greek philosophy, it's just they just sidestep it. And nearly all Western philosophy and a lot of Middle Eastern philosophy is developed from that. So again, they don't, they don't address it. But it's a very fundamental question, who are you? And by answering that question, we're, we're going beyond Ritta. We're questioning what's behind Ritta. This organization, what prompted the organization? So now you're developing into the theological space. This, this philosophical um, understanding uh, leads you to question what's, what's behind it all. So, Theology is developed from this philosophical basis. And it's very important to understand for our ISKCON, um, primarily, that all our theological thinking, all our discussion about God has a philosophical basis. In the Western um, approach, in Judaism, Christianity, and, and Islam, they don't emphasize um, a philosophical basis. They emphasize faith, they emphasize the authority, the revelation, but they don't emphasize that there's a philosophical basis to it. There doesn't have to be a philosophical basis. So Islam, for many centuries, was highly philosophical. In actual fact, we have the works of Aristotle because of Islam. The West actually lost these works. So they have translated the works into Arabic, and they retranslated them back into Greek for the benefit of the Westerners. Thomas Aquinas had to address all the issues he had to address because of his response to Islamic philosophy. But at some point in the game, someone stood up and said, by the grace of God, you are saved. You don't need all this. And everyone kind of goes, oh, okay. And that's the end of philosophical discussion. You can't do that in our tradition, because the basis is philosophical. Philosophy and theology work like this. You can't take them apart. Because the self is eternal. Now, if the self is eternal, what's the one thing that the self has? What's the one power that we have eternally? We might have some power as Lord of blah blah on a temporary basis. 
What's the one power we have eternally that is absolutely ours? Nobody else's. Choose. Desire. 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 There's a lot of opinion in the room. Free will. Desire. Free will. Free will and desire. Let's, let's, let's put them together. Consciousness. Consciousness. Existence. Existence. No. Choice and independence. Choice and independence. And um, it's all that because if you're if you are Atma, you are existing and you are conscious. But the, the one thing we have that we can do with that is desire. Desire. Is desire. And desire leads to action. What do you do before you act? Choose. Choices. Choosing. You make choices. Thinking, feeling, willing. Thinking, feeling, willing. Thank you very much. You make choices. You make choice that you get a body in which you can think, feel, and will. You have to make choices. I'm, I'm in the spiritual world, I'd like to be somewhere else, please, where I can think, feel, and will. But the desire, it means you make choices. And that's, and that understanding that that's all we really have, is choice. We don't really have much else. The only real freedom we have is choice. So this idea of eternal existence, we're eternally existing, but within a bigger picture. And what we have is choice. And choice is extremely powerful. Look what we do with our choices. People become kings and look at Trump choose to be president and he became the president. Ta-da! <laughs> we can do anything. <laughs> or we, we, we can become a bank robber or a sex abuser. This, uh, each choice is powerful. And uh, these choices can have a massive effect on everything around us. The choice to create the atomic bomb means we have the capacity to destroy the whole planet. It's all based on choice, and it comes right, right down to it. That's all that happened. Someone made a choice. And a lot of people say that. You know, they, they admit that when they're, they go get all this power and everything like that. They say, oh, I, I just chose to do this. I, I went this, and I didn't know it was going to happen, and all that kind of thing. It may interest you to know that our good friend Adolf Hitler, um, in 1919, was up giving a speech, and he got down from the podium, and um, Someone said, you should be the leader. And he said, no, 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 no. Oh. He had no idea to be the leader. Oh. Some idiot chose to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> and he chose to accept. And look what happened. Choices. How do we, how do we get there? <laughs> and we make choices for, as we know, for all kinds of reasons. That's, we can get into the whole discussion of desire. But the idea of Atma, of the eternal self, the important thing for us to remember here is that the eternal self means essentially for us the energy of life, the source of life. This energy is life as distinct from non-life. In ecological terms, it means that any living thing is to be respected. And every living thing is a citizen, has rights, has needs. We should be concerned about it. So the idea of namaste, that they say in all the yoga studios now, boring me. But you're offering respect to the life within, <laughs> to the atma, to the person. But so you're in India, and it happened to me, I got bumped by someone, I turned around and go, oh, namaste, and it was <laughs> But I didn't take it back. What was it? No, it was a cow. It was a cow. Yeah. And as you're walking by, you come out of the temple and some dump where actually kind of go, <laughs> you find yourself paying respect to everyone. What a wonderful culture. Because you're respecting all life. Now our modern culture, the basis of our legal system, we discussed about it before, the basis of our legal system is the dignity of the human being. This is enlightenment thinking, uh, trying to get away from the religious concepts of the sacredness of the self. So it's the dignity of the human being. That's the, Lord, that's the common denominator of the legal system, which means it's the common denominator of our social policies, our environmental policies, and our political theories. But this thinking means, it is saying that it is the, the dignity of all life. That should be the basis of our society. And that means we're not speciesist. And that means we're not preferring humans. Humans are not special in, in these Ritta terms, cyclical terms, or in Atma terms. And again, this brings it down to a, a certain pluralism. A very big, big, big picture idea. 
but it has practical application. Um, and then I will wind up this session with um, the reason why I picked these two was the relationship then between these two different realities, the material reality and the spiritual reality. What's the relationship between these two? Two completely interconnected realities. And philosophically, people looking from this perspective look at this and say, it's only the material world, why should we care? It doesn't matter. It's the material world, because we're spiritual and we're eternal and it's all going to change anyway and it's all cycles, it's going to go up and down why should I put energy into it? but who is the person who is the very earth itself? Who's the very Krishna the very what? Sorry. the very earth itself the Atarva Veda says earth is mother I am a child of earth who is this mother? Mother has a name. Durga, Bumi. Durga, not Durga, Bumi. Durga is a completely different person. The overall mother of Bumi. No, no. Bumi is very specific. She's not the overall mother. I think we can't. We've got to get this right. <laughs> Bumi is the wife of Vishnu. If you, go, if you see Vishnu, there's two women standing beside him, Lakshmi and Bu. Bu Devi is Bumi. This is quite a profound relationship. Bumi comes and knocks on Rama's door. There's a lot happening down here. I need some help. She has an urge at <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Brahma has to run off to Vishnu, and Vishnu has to come down, and he has to be Krishna, and all, all the all the his family has to come down, and demigods and devotees and associates, and they all do the thing. <coughs> and then when they're finished, Brahma comes and says, that was great. That was great. Fantastic. Well done. You have to leave now, though, because you can't stay too powerful. Because Mother Earth, if you stay, it'll be powerful on your Earth. Mother Earth will be knocking on my door again. <laughs> Please, can you go? The, what an arrangement to satisfy who? Who? These things are exceedingly interconnected. Kabumi rests here. Bumi is the wife of Vishnu. Bumi is a person. So this relationship thing has just taken on a completely different... Aura. So we can't reject the material. In all its forms, there's going to be people attached all over the place. And particularly Mother Earth. Mother Earth is taken very seriously by everyone. All the very gods. She knocks on Brahma's door, he's right there. Anyone else knocks on his door? Well, to get to his door is a trip. But you know, Bumi gets there right, right from the get-go. If Bumi's disturbed, the whole universe has to walk around with her. Oh, I've got to do something. The power of femininity, that's just for the ladies, not sure. So, <laughs> so when you refer to Bumi, it's like this planet, Earth, or yes. it's all the, all the planets, all the Earth? This planet, all the, all the this Earth. particular planet, the Earth. Okay. So we have to take Bumi seriously. This is, this is philosophical, and now we're entering the theological. And that's why I want to stop this presentation there, because Sri Rai Karamanji will help develop this in very interesting ways, more theological. Thank you very much. Thank you.